welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. Okay. Where did I leave my keys? Where was that quote I read of in that book that I wanted to use in my sermon. When is my next doctor's appointment? You see, being able to remember is part of daily life. For some of you, I'm sure remembering things is not an issue. But you know, when you get to my age, sometimes remembering is not all that easy. Things don't come to mind as quickly as they want to. Remembering for some is easy and delightful. For others, it can be a very real challenge. Let me illustrate. Many of you know the words, the terms, the name of C.H. Spurgeon. I'm sure uh, in preaching, if you've been here for any length of time at all, the name of the Prince of Preachers has been employed as some quotation given. C.H. Spurgeon is said to have had a virtual photographic memory. He prepared his... Sunday evening sermons on Sunday afternoon. And he could do that because he was always reading and he always remembered what he had read. He could recollect whatever he had read often many years later. He could reproduce a citation nearly word for word, years after having read that book or article. He was quite unique in that sense. He had a marvelous God-given capacity to remember things. On the other hand, that great missionary doctor, David Livingston, as a young man preparing for ministry, he was uh, taught how to prepare a sermon, and then he had to submit it to his teacher in order to be edited, and then he was expected to memorize it. He wasn't allowed, as I do Sunday by Sunday, he wasn't allowed to bring any notes into the pulpit with him. And Vance Christie, in his recent book on David Livingston, records, one Sunday, Livingston was sent to deliver an evening message at a village church. After reading the scripture text for his sermon very deliberately, Livingston found he could not recall a single word of his intended discourse. And after a painful silence, he blurted out, Friends, I have forgotten everything I was going to say. And then he hastened humbly out of the church. He did, of course, grow with time and with experience and became a wonderful translator and uh, use of language. But at the beginning, memory just wouldn't aid him. Remembering is part of our daily life, but it is also a discipline in our Christian life. And this was brought out to us in that reading from Deuteronomy chapter 8. 
because I'm not sure whether you recognize that word remember as we went through that chapter. But you find it again and again and again, God saying, remember. And as you read the history of Israel, as you read the words of the prophets, you cannot help but recognize that Israel's failure came about because of their failure to remember. They forgot the word of God. They forgot to remember. And so Peter, as the shadow of the valley was falling over him, he wrote this second epistle, and three times in that first chapter, three times in four verses, he says to them, remember, remember, remember. And what was it that he wanted them to remember? Nothing new, nothing recent, nothing novel or trendy. He simply wanted them to remember what they already knew. He wanted them to remember the gospel. He brings that out in verses 3 through 4. He wanted them to remember the graces of the gospel in verses 5 through 11. And so it is that our Lord Jesus Christ himself emphasized the discipline of remembering and clearly defined what we are to remember when he said those words which we have focused on this morning. Do this in remembrance of me. The Lord's table is a means of grace, and it's given to us to stir up our memories and to discipline our remembrance. Our remembrance of Him. And what riches, what wealth is gathered up in that word. In remembrance of Him. Do this in remembrance of me. To remember Him whose name is and whose character is recorded for us, particularly this morning, in the familiar words of Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6. The wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Attributes that we we usually simply recall during Christmas. I'm sure it's only, it's only that time of the year when you hear sermons on such a text. It's a Christmas text. But surely, my friends, it is to be the subject of our remembrance during all four seasons of the year. We are to remember Him. And so I'm simply saying to you this morning, I'm not going to give you anything new. I'm not going to give you anything novel. I'm not going to say anything trendy. I'm just wanting to simply this morning remind you of what you know or maybe you have forgotten. And that is that our Lord is the wonderful counselor. And therefore, there is no problem he cannot solve. There is no problem he cannot solve. Mary had a problem. Mary came to our Lord and said, They have no wine. 
It's the wedding at Cana. They have no wine. No. You can't really have a wedding without wine. You've got to have wine. There's got to be joy. There's got to be the delight. We, we, have, no, we have no wine. That was your problem. And what did Jesus do? He turned the water into wine. No wine. No problem. No problem for Jesus. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, had a problem. There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And so Jesus took the loaves and fishes, gave thanks, and they were all filled with 12 basketfuls of leftovers. Nothing to eat? No problem. No problem. Bartimaeus, he had a problem. He was blind. He was sitting, begging by the roadside. And Jesus called him. And he came and Jesus simply said to him, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? And he said, To recover my sight. To recover my sight. And so Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight. Blindness. No problem. There is no problem that he cannot solve. Including the greatest problem of all. For as has been said... The only problem, the only real problem which God had to confront was the forgiveness of sins. For you see, God is just and righteous and holy and true. So he cannot contradict himself. He cannot simply pronounce forgiveness. He cannot simply pretend that a crime, a sin, has not been committed. He cannot just turn his back on transgression. Because sin, whatever the nature of that sin, is always against him. It's an affront to him. And so here's the problem. On the one hand you have sinful man, on the other hand you have a holy God. But how was that problem solved? Listen to the hymn writer. O oh, loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. Here was displayed, my friends, the wisdom of our wonderful counselor, for only by the doing and dying of Jesus, only by the shedding of His precious blood, only by the cross work of Christ, was that problem solved. Only by the blood of heaven's beloved Son was pardon procured. And that is what we must never forget. That is what we need to remember day by day. That the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses me from every sin. That I can go to Him because my problem, my sin problem has been solved by a holy God. The wonderful Counselor. There is no problem in your life and in my life that he cannot solve. We take it to the Lord in prayer. The wonderful counselor. So what else are we to remember? Well, this. 
He's the mighty God. He's the mighty God. And so we're to remember, there is no protection that He cannot supply. There is no protection that He cannot supply. You see, you get this title, you get this characteristic in other places. In Isaiah 10 and verse 21, a remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. You find it in Deuteronomy 10, 17. For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords. He is great. He is mighty. He is the awesome God. And the implication of this title, the implication of this name, this character, is that He is one who can help us. He is one in whom we can hope. The almost literal translation of the term is, He is the warrior God. He is the warrior God who defeats armies and who dislodges idols. He is the one who is able. Listen to the words of John Calvin who put it this way. He is therefore called the mighty God for the same reason that he was formerly called Emmanuel. For if we find in Christ nothing but flesh and nature of man, our glory will be foolish and vain, and our hope will rest on an uncertain and insecure foundation. But if he shows himself to be to us God, the mighty God, we may now rely upon him with safety. And so what did the Apostle Paul write? Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. Now, while our warrior God protects us so that we can rely on Him, He protects us in accordance with His providence and His spirit purpose for us and his plans for us you say Brian what do you mean well in Acts chapter 12 verses 1 to 10 we find that Peter is in prison but the Lord sends an angel to Peter and his chains fall off he passes through the guards The iron gate yields, and Peter is wonderfully protected and delivered. He is free. But then you come over to Daniel chapter 3, and you have the story, the record of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen to the words. I'm going to to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. These men refused to worship false gods. These men were more inclined to obedience to God, even than seeking deliverance. Their desire was to worship God. And so what was the conclusion of the matter? Verse 24 and 25 of that third chapter. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up and hissed. He declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, king. And he answered and said, But I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. 
delivered, protected. But there are two things we need to learn from this. And the first is this. This incident here is a sample of the way our mighty God protects his people. It's a sample. Get that in your mind. It's a sample of how at times in God's providence and plan he does protect his people. It is not a guarantee of dramatic deliverance and protection in every case. But what hope we glean from this incident, what joy we glean is the fact, if I may quote the words of Dale Ralph Davis, the fourth man can always find his people. The fourth man can always find his people. Be they in a prison like Peter, be they in a fiery furnace like these three friends, or be, be they in a, a storm-tossed ship like the Apostle Paul in Acts 27. But in saying all of that, there are times when God's protection seems to be absent to us. Because that very chapter that talks about Peter's deliverance and protection, at the beginning we read these words, James was killed. You read on and you find that Stephen is cast out of the city and he is stoned to death. I remember January 8, 1956, five young missionaries killed by spears on the banks of a river in Ecuador. And so we ask, do we not, where, where is mighty God? Where is this divine protection? And oh, beloved, we come back to this. He was there ordering the event, accomplishing his purposes, taking the slain saints safely home to glory, planting seed for the growth of his church. His protection was there, we just don't see it. And our problem so often is this, we fail to see the fourth man. Because we walk by sight and not by faith. How did Martin Luther understand this theme and this title? His favorite psalm, Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, the very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. And what's his hymn? With force of arms we nothing can, full soon we were downridden, but for us fights the proper man, whom God himself hath hidden. He and no other one shall conquer in the battle. And so Luther's prayer, O oh, gracious God, I owe gratitude unto you alone, for it is of your glory that you show forth your wisdom and power in my unworthiness, foolishness, and weakness. What are we to remember? There is no problem that he cannot solve. There is no protection he cannot supply. And so thirdly, we are to remember that he is our everlasting father. Therefore, there is no pity he cannot show. There is no pity he cannot show. Now, there's a textual, technical point here in this, uh, in this title. 
Because we must remember that Isaiah is writing of a child being born and a son being given. So that this name, this title, Everlasting Father, does not refer in this instance to God the Father, but to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. And the meaning is, therefore, that the Son shares and shows the same attributes as the Father. The Son functions as a Father because He came to show us the Father. Isn't that what He said to Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So what is true of the Father is true of the Son. In the words of the Athanasian Creed, such as the Father is, such is the Son. So what are we to remember here? Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, deals with us as a Father deals with his children consistently, continuously, compassionately. For, dear friends, he knows our frame and he remembers that we are dust. And so he gives us grace for our weakness, he grants us pardon for our waywardness and He gives us rest in our weariness. He says to us, don't be anxious. Don't be anxious because He knows all our needs. And he says to us, oh, my dear child, don't, don't be burdened. Come to me. And I, I will give you rest. And as a father is responsible for the care of his children, so too our father. For the scripture says to us, does it not? Cast, cast all of your care upon him. Because he, he cares for you. He cares for you. What gentleness of spirit, what tenderness of heart. My dear friends, this morning, everything you've ever dreamed a father could be, Jesus is and will be for you. Sadly, the word father doesn't always bring to mind compassion and care and pity and protection. Far too many children experience hurt and harm, indifference and neglect by their fathers. But not so Jesus. He is our everlasting father. That means once, once we are his we are His forever. That there will be no goodbyes with Him. If I may quote Spurgeon, there is no unfathering Christ and there is no unchildering us. Nothing can separate us from His powerful pity and his steadfast love and his gracious compassion because he is our everlasting father. And yet, how sadly it is that so frequently we forget his gentleness and we doubt his tenderness and we forsake his promises and we fail to rest on his fatherliness. We, we listen to our own voice 
or we listen to the voices of this world rather than the voice of the Father. You know, I was reminded just the other, the other day when I was reading the account of Jesus' transfiguration in Matthew's gospel, in Matthew chapter 17. And, and this struck me as it hadn't struck me before. You probably said it and seen it, and as I told you, I'm not telling you anything new this morning. But you, but you read this, while Peter was still speaking, a voice from the cloud said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. What's the picture? Peter is speaking. And the father says, Peter, keep quiet for a minute. The father interrupts Peter. He says, Peter, just be quiet and listen. Listen to what my son has to say to you. And what did the son say? Have no fear. Have no fear. How often we need to learn to stop, to stop doubting, to stop fearing, to stop laboring, and to simply remember that Jesus, God's beloved Son, loves us as the Father, cares for us as the Father. We're precious to him as the Father. He is the one who is our everlasting Father. And so there's no pity he cannot show. In his hands, he gently bears us and he rescues us from every foe. Because finally, he is the, the what? He is the Prince of Peace. And therefore, there is no power that he cannot subdue. There is no power he cannot subdue. Now, this, 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 this element, this theme of, of power and authority uh, is very much the, uh, the theme that runs through Mark's gospel. Because Mark is uh, uh, eager to show us Christ in action, in his power and his authority. And therefore, we, we, we read of his, his power, his authority in, in, his, in his teaching. His power over, over sickness. His power over the elements. He can control, he can speak, he can muzzle the wind and the waves. They obey his voice. His power even over death. The incident of Jairus' daughter being raised. And then we see his power over sin and hell and death. For by his own death and resurrection, there is the death of death itself. And thus the apostle is able to write in 1 Corinthians, O death, where's your victory? Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when victory is won and all opposition is removed, peace comes. And the one who bought and brought peace is our Lord Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And therefore, He is our peace. And He has made peace. And having been justified by Christ, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we may experience His peace within us, that peace which passes understanding. However, the context of Isaiah 9-6 points to more than our possession and experience of peace. Because when you read Isaiah 9, verses 4 and 5, that describes the context that gives to us a description of the setting of this child who bears these names. And the conditions are these. It's a world at war. There's oppression and there's combat. Conditions that we today know so very well. And so this title of prince 
It's the same word as you get in Joshua chapter 5. When Joshua went out and he sees a figure of a man. And who is that figure? I am the commander of the army of the Lord. That word commander is our word prince. This is Jesus. Commander of the army of the Lord. The word points to the one with ruling power and authority. The power held by our prince. And the power which is, which is displayed so wonderfully in that second psalm. You remember that, Sam? The, the, there we hear the, the rage of the nations. There we see the insanity of the nations. There we see the hostility of the nations against this anointed one, against the Prince of Peace. But what, what's heard in the halls of heaven? Laughter. Laughter. For again, if I quote John Calvin, our prince needs no additional power to repress the rebellion of wicked men. No, 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 no. He rules and he reigns with all power and authority. And you look at history. And you see what devastations this prince has wrought. He laughs and displays the outpouring of his wrath until he has exposed their infatuated rage to general derision. Our commander, our prince, our savior is not trembling in his shoes today, my friends. He's not anxious over the affairs of this world. And it's this that we are to remember as we watch the evening news. This is what we are to remember when all around us is hatred and hostility and death and decay and ruin and rebellion and godlessness and immorality. Our prince has not vacated his throne. No, 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 no. He holds all authority and power in heaven and on earth. And he says to us, don't forget, I'm with you always. I'm with you always. He rules the world. And so we take heart and are of good courage. Because you see, there are times when it's only remembering this truth that he has the power to subdue all things under him. It's only in remembering this truth that will quieten our heart and keep us from going insane. This is the only truth that will bring us stability in this unstable world. So my friends, nothing new this morning. Just this. Don't forget him. Remember him, the wonderful counselor, because there's no problem he cannot solve. Remember him, the mighty God, because there's no protection he cannot supply. Remember him, the everlasting father, because there's no pity he cannot show. And remember that he is our prince of peace, and therefore there is no power he cannot subdue. Remember, because if you remember, it will lead to rejoicing. For remembering is a spiritual discipline, a discipline in the Christian's life. Failure to remember only leads to one thing. Failure. Failure. Failure to remember only leads to failure. And that's why Jesus said twice, so we didn't forget it. Do this in remembrance of me.
Let's pray. Father, thank you that you know us. Our folly and our foolishness, our forgetfulness, taken up with so many things, impressed by other things, overawed by circumstances, fearful because of the age in which we live, burdens that we carry. Oh, Father, open our eyes. Help us to remember. Help us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith for our joy and for your glory. Amen.